This is a book review of Macho Time, a, a biography of Hector Camacho by Christian Judis. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Judis has written three other books on three of my favorite fighters, Roberto Duran, Alexis Arguello, and Wilfredo Gomez. The one on Gomez I haven't read yet, but it's on my list. and I have, the, I have read the books on Duran and Arguello, and they were great reads, as is this book on Camacho. This is a must-have for any fight fan of the 1980s in particular, as uh, I had a total recall of Camacho's fights that are, are written about here. Uh, Camacho was one of the most controversial fighters of his time period, and Macho Time was uh, between 1983 and 1985. He had his high point in 1985 when he decisioned the always tough uh, Jose Luis Ramirez over 12 rounds. And after that fight, he was considered one of the best pound-for-pound fighters in the world, and the sky was the limit for his potential. But his career was forever altered by one left hook by Edwin Rosario in 1986. And in looking back at that fight, it it could be considered as the best lightweight fight of the 1980s. But unfortunately for Camacho, it shed him of his aura of being the unbeatable fighter. But I'm in the minority in that I thought that the judges did get it right that night. I thought Camacho squeaked by Rosario in that fight. Uh, But the critics and the fans jumped off his bandwagon, and this made him lose a lot of self-confidence. A lot of people say that Camacho changed his style after that fight to that of a a grab-and-run fighter, and I disagree with that, because if you look at his early fights, he would run and use a clinching as a defensive maneuver, but uh, from 1983 to 1985, he was just so fast, you didn't notice it. But after that Rosario fight, he's... I would expect his drug use increased, so he started to just slow down, and that's when you really noticed how much he was running and clinching. So, uh, and then yeah, this book also describes a, uh, a verbal exchange between Camacho ha- and, and Ray Mancini, and Mancini complains that uh, all Camacho did was hold like a woman and uh, run like a dog, and Camacho's reply was, I'd rather run than get beat up. Uh, This book delivers some facts that I didn't know about Camacho and that he was uh, originally trained by Robert Lee and not Billy Giles as I had thought for so long. Uh, Camacho would later go through trainers quicker than he changes his outfits. And uh, he was also done wrong by uh, some of his trainers when it came to money. Uh, Even the experienced uh, Jimmy Montoya, who prepped Camacho for his fight with Ramirez, would jump ship after that fight and uh, work the opposing corner when Camacho faced Rosario, and that was a move that uh, Montoya would later regret. So in the boxing world, it seemed like Camacho was often friendless, so he, he turned to his old boys from the hood, all of whom seemed to be you know really steeped in the drug culture of, of Spanish Harlem, New York. So Camacho found it uh, more of a comfort to uh, hang around with his partying friends rather than uh, ring his boxing talent for all it was worth. So uh, I think that was... It was this that decision to hang around as uh, drug dealing friends, drug use, drug using friends, uh, that led to his downfall more so than uh, Rosario's left hook. Uh, that being said, uh, Judice doesn't really go into the specifics of uh, how bad Camacho's cocaine addiction was. Uh, Camacho's addiction never went to the depths of, uh, say, someone like Aaron Pryor. And, uh, but the fact that, you know, he was using drugs, it, it was remarkable that he was able to compete at such a high level for so long. You know, he was, you know, basically the, the poster child of the partying 80s. You know, he's living up to that Beastie Boys song, uh, You Gotta Fight for Your Right to Party. Uh, but unfortunately, he chose that route instead of becoming uh, boxing's, one of boxing's elite, which he certainly could have done. So looking back at Camacho's career in, in retrospect, uh, you know, on a superficial level, he, he epitomizes that Teddy Atlas's dictum of, of how some fighters make the choice of fighting to win, while others make the choice of, you know, just trying to survive. Uh, but I think Camacho's decline goes even deeper than that, as the author describes him as you know, being a lot more sensitive than people realize. He, he was never fully accepted by fans in Puerto Rico, and that really hurt him. And uh, he just and after the Rosario fight, he just got so fed up with all the criticism and naysayers and all these uh, his trainers and managers are betraying him. He probably reached the point in his career where he became indifferent. 
and even his uh, son Camacho Jr. said by, by the time Camacho fought Mancini, his heart really wasn't into the sport anymore. He was just doing it, you know, more so for the money and the um, being in the spotlight. So if there's any uh, irony in his career, um, you know, he was deemed as not being very macho uh, in his run and grab efforts after facing Rosario, but he was praised for his toughness after uh, being able to take on the likes of uh, and take his beating against a uh, prime Julio Cesar Chavez and, and Oscar de la Hoya. So one of the more interesting revelations in the book was his relationship with his son, uh, Camacho Jr. In Camacho Jr.'s interviews, he's He's the opposite of his father. He comes across as a very polite and uh, introspective guy. And um, But evidently, Camacho Sr. wanted his son to be macho like him. And this um, caused a lot of strife for Camacho Jr. in his early years. Uh, Camacho Sr. introduced him to weed, and he got one of the ladies of the evening to introduce him to sex. The book ends with Camacho Jr. taking a look back at his father's life and ultimately realizing that his father did win, you know, took his family from the poverty of Spanish Harlem to the peaceful confines of Clewiston, Florida, where they, they wanted for nothing. Um, I did find one inaccuracy in the book. Uh, that's in that uh, Wilfred Benitez is described as winning the welterweight title from Antonio Cervantes, when in fact it was the 140-pound title. But other than that, there aren't any glaring inaccuracies, and, and everything is in alignment with what took place in that era of fighters. As the author, is, he's obviously a boxing guy. He's not a generic journalist who doesn't really know the history of the sport and a, the taxonomy of different fighters, how fighters are, are, he knows how fighters are classified and is able to differentiate between, um, you know, guys like Greg Haugen and Edwin Rosario and their, their different styles and how they presented themselves to Hector Camacho. So I recommend Macho Time. You can Check out uh, my affiliate link below and my own book on 1970s heavyweight boxing in the description box. Uh, thanks for listening.